You guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath, and in this episode, I'm going to talk to you guys about some of my favorite releases of the year 2020. This is the final video of 2020, and I want to kind of go out on a personal note. This is not a best of list. This is not even like a, a year in review or that sort of a thing. I'll probably do something like that early January of 2021, looking back at the year that was, because I really think look, it was a crazy year for physical media. Uh, I believe that as we move forward, we will look back at 2020 as the absolute top of the mountain. I do not think any year will ever surpass 2020 for physical media. Um, I think we're living in a golden age and 2020 was the top. And, uh, and so that's coming. This is more personal. This is just the stuff that really resonated with me, right? Because um, in a year filled with so many wonderful things, you know, I'm so enthusiastic about so much of this stuff that, that comes out. We're, we're really living in charmed, blessed times. But there's stuff that meant even more. So the, personal, the, the things you make a personal connection with. And you can't explain it. There's no criteria that you could write down on paper. It's just the stuff that really worked its way into your heart. So that's what we're going to do in this video. Let's just kick it right off. By the way, movies, music, um, books, even my favorite video game of the year. So I, I want to kick it off with probably the biggest <laughs> the biggest ever the gunsmoke dvd box set this is the complete series of gunsmoke 20 seasons like 600 and something episodes it is um i can't believe it exists and it's become really hard to find like as soon as this thing came out it almost immediately went back out of print i don't know if it was a pandemic related production issue um but there's so much that I could say about this. Look, there's a video. I think everything we're going to talk about here, there is a video for it. So it's not the first time we're talking about it. So maybe what I'll do is I'll put links to the uh, the videos in the description of this video. So if you scroll under me, you will see links to further further exploration for these. But this is, it's a remarkable release. It's the culmination of well over a decade of Gunsmoke, really about 15 years worth of Gunsmoke releases. We didn't know if it was ever going to get finished because this is, here's the thing, TV on DVD, not a sure thing. People stream TV. They don't often buy TV, especially in the current marketplace. TV sales are not what they were, TV on DVD sales. Uh, so, you know, is there a Blu-ray coming? I doubt it. I really do. I think, I think this was probably it for Gunsmoke. And I'm so happy to have it. I have Gunsmoke in my collection. Access forever. Uh, let's move on to books. I'm going to kind of mix it up. We'll not stick with just movies or TV. or We'll, we'll jump around. The Canon Film Guide Volume 1 by Austin Trunick. We interviewed Austin. I had him on here to talk about the book and what it... The, what went into it? This is volume one of the can, the story of Canon. Um, it's an incredible resource. Canon, the Canon company, these are the movies that I grew up with. They are, it's wild. Some of the stuff is good. It's critically acclaimed. Some of the stuff is just candy bar cinema, but it's all an amazing story. And it's a story that's been overdue for a scholarly, really detailed investigation and, uh, and accounts, and that's what this book is. I mean, look, it's over 500 pages. Interviews, stories, research, behind the scenes, photographs, posters, uh, and this is volume one of three. So um, check out our, uh, our interview with Austin about this book, but this is truly one of the most magnificent releases of the entire year as is the Bruce Lee, but oh, I'm wearing my, this was not even, I didn't plan this, I'm wearing my Bruce Lee shirt. Uh, and uh, this is one of my Christmas presents from a friend. Uh, the, the Criterion set, yeah, I, I've heard all the criticisms about this set. Like, yeah, it's missing this. and it, does, it doesn't have to be the definitive Bruce Lee document, but it's pretty fantastic. And having the movies in this quality with the special features, and I mean, they are loaded with a lot of content on these discs. And uh, here's something else. This set brings Bruce Lee to the masses you walk into barnes and noble you walk into best buy you know like this is available for uh everybody to have access to and it's really great again definitive perhaps no but pretty wonderful so i love this release where to go you know let's go back to tv i want to talk about the flintstones the complete series i i mean i love hanna barbera animation I grew up with the Flintstones. I mean, this is really, you look at like, when you finish this video, you're gonna be like, oh, the stuff that he just covered, that's the heart of Serial at Midnight. Really, all of these things 
are the heart of Serial at Midnight. And because I am kind of the face of Serial at Midnight, it is my baby. Like, it's the heart of Heath, right? So the Flintstones, the complete series on Blu-ray. Yeah, there's one episode that is missing the music and the sound effects. We've done a full review for this. I showed you before and after, like DVD versus Blu-ray screenshots. Uh, replacement program in the works to fix that one episode. So it doesn't even matter, right? It's being taken care of. But to have the entire series of the Flintstones with most of the extras that existed already in one package, and I mean, this thing was like... 60 i think at one point it was down into the 50s like 50 something dollars for six seasons of the flintstones some of us paid that for one season on dvd wonderful times top of the mountain you guys so uh i i'm really i, I it's it's wild it's really wild um the criterion edition of the war of the worlds is stunning it's truly magnificent the restoration for the movie itself is is great but the special features as well you know i i talk a lot i i'm critical of a lot of special features because there's just nothing there it's like hey war of the worlds was great cut to talking head one war of the worlds was great talking head number two war of the worlds was great you need some substance with your special features uh, and this has a lot. Ben Burt, the sound effects designer for uh, the for Star Wars, the guy that made the laser blaster sounds and R two D two and Chewbacca's roar, he's here talking about the sound design and how they did the special effects for the World of the Worlds. They're showing they like down on their hands and knees, displaying like how they do current arcs, like electricity arcs and things. Absolutely magnificent stuff. And the legendary. Orson Welles radio program that shocked the nation uh, when it first aired in the 30s is here in its entirety. I mean, there's just a ton of stuff here. So uh, a wonderful release for a wonderful movie. Uh, I want to talk about bitmap books, the games that weren't. I, I, the, the same thing that I say about uh, the Canon film guide, this, this is journalism. This is uh, a massive tome. Uh, how many pages? It's over 600 pages of scholarship about games that never made it to the final production. And there's so much to learn here. I'd be lying if I told you I'd read every word in here yet because it's just, it's an exhaustive document. But like, you know, the Waterworld game for different systems, like things that maybe they were complete and they just didn't get distribution at the last moment. Maybe they were just ideas. Uh, it's a really incredible book about things. You know, it's one thing to be like, yeah, the Atari had this. It's another thing to go so far into uh, history and alternate history. It's, it's wonderful. Bitmap Books continues to impress me with the work that they're doing. So uh, we're going to continue to cover them here at Serial at Midnight. But I think that's the best thing that they've done to date. Certainly the best thing uh, in 2020. Mill Creek Entertainment, the Hammer Films, 20 film sets. Um, this is, I love Hammer and to have 20 movies in one box set for the price that they were charging. I mean, you just say, let's call it a hundred bucks because you know, it just depends on what retailer you go to. But, uh, Hammer in the U S has been difficult to obtain over the last 20, 30 years. You know, certain studios have certain films. Mill Creek comes along and basically releases everything that they have access to you know these are the films that exist within the uh the the columbia library and in fact there's even kind of a documentary about the uh the hammer hammer's work for this in, in this particular era for this studio the partnership that existed and it was this partnership that brought us yes it's horror but it's also the swashbucklers it's the foreign intrigue movie the terror of the tongs that kind of a thing it's the uh psychological thrillers it's the bank heist movie i mean there's so many it's a, such a great representation of hammer and yes there are other ways that you can get this movie get these movies but not in one place and not in one package and not for that price and i love the special features from ballyhoo um Ballyhoo Motion Pictures, Daniel Griffith's company, which they're also on the Inner Sanctum Mystery set. Another one of my absolute favorite releases. I love Lon Chaney Jr. I love Universal. Uh, and to have these movies, there are six films. Five of the six are breathtaking in their restorations. The sixth one I suspect that there was source issues for. Uh, to, it's, it's speculation because we don't know, but I suspect that there were source issues. Either way, 
um, to be able to have all these, all six of these movies in one place with again new special features, very informative and educational special features from Ballyhoo. It's a great pleasure to talk to Daniel Griffith in an interview this year. We just had one uh, just a few weeks ago as I'm recording this video, but to talk to him about you know kind of what went on making the special features for these things. Uh, C. Courtney Joyner, someone who I respect tremendously, pops up on this stuff. Um, where do I, you know what, let's do music. We haven't done any music yet. The Johnny Cash at Mercury uh, box set. There were a series of, Johnny Cash was basically in the 80s, he was kind of let go from Columbia. That's where he had been since the Sun days, since Sun Records. So decades at Mercury, and he gets kind of, I'm sorry, decades at Columbia, then he gets cut loose and, and signed by Mercury. These albums have been very hard to find for a long time. You can find them if you look for them, but they're kind of rare. So along comes this box set, presents uh, remasters of all the music and like a whole album of alternate mixes. Is the music like as good as his 50s era stuff? I mean, to me, no, it's not. Good is good is not necessarily the point. It's the access. It's the ability to study and to do the research and to learn and to see, just to experience the art that he made during that period. Uh, to have been unavailable for so long. It's it's really cool that we have access to that again. So I, I've had a really good time delving into that box set. Uh, I want to talk about imprint films, Via Vision Entertainment's imprint films. I mean, I would put everything they've done on my best of list because it's a company, like the imprint label did not exist before 2020. And in this one single year, uh, like two dozen releases, including the Hammer House of Horror, um, the, the major Dundee restoration that they did, but at the core of it, my favorite releases from everything that they've released over the past year, uh, is, uh, when worlds collide, because I love my 50s science fiction films. I love the metaphors in them. I just love how they, you know, my heart is in the retro, right? And danger diabolic. Now, Shell factory, Scream Factory, if you want to call it that. They put out a version of Danger Diabolic 2. They're almost identical. They have almost identical special features. This one has an additional 30 minutes uh, video essay. Let me read it exactly to you. Exclusive video essay by film historian Kat Ellinger. So, uh, Kat Ellinger's popped up on a lot of special features in 2020. And um, that is something that the other release does not have. So, of course, that gives it the edge because it's. Danger Diabolic is so much of what I love in one film. It's campy, but it's fun. It's spy. It's twangy, cool music. It's Ennio Morricone. Um, I just love it so much. And these two releases kind of embody the spirit of what Imprint is doing. They're taking these movies that they're not uncommon movies. It's not like no one's ever heard of them, but they're movies that need love. They need a home. They need a high definition presentation. They're really movies for people like us, for cinephiles, for collectors. Uh, not necessarily the most mainstream picks, but they're movies that need... There's just, Imprint has come along, ViaVision has come along, and they've seen the gap in the market and said, we can fill that. And they've done an absolutely incredible job with it. So uh, this is a company that in 2020 has not only been placed on my radar, but has like shot to the top of my list. My respect for these guys is off the charts. Um, let's go back to music really quick. I wanna talk about the Mitch Ryder and Detroit Wheels box set. This is called Socking It To You, the complete dino voice slash new uh, new voice recordings is essentially the complete Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels. If you're not sure who that is, um, they do a wonderful cover of Devil in a Blue Dress. The one you want to look up, if you're looking up, in fact, when we finish this video, I want you to go YouTube, uh, Jenny Take a Ride, because that it, that's, it's like CC Ryder. It is CC Ryder, but it, they've put their own spin on it. They've kind of combined a couple of songs. And if you can stay still during that song, you might have a medical condition. I don't know. I love this stuff. 60s, blue-eyed soul. Mitch Ryder was, uh, you know, the, I, don't, I would say maybe this didn't last, this this vibe, this tone. But this is this is uh, all in one place. And it, the, a lot of this stuff comes out of the UK. Like this box set comes out of the UK. The, uh, what is the label of this? Um, RPM? I don't know. Anyway, uh, I recommend it wholeheartedly. You know what? I know where I want to go. I want to talk about 
the Mission Impossible Blu-ray box set. This is not the movies. My loyalty is probably closer to this, the original 1960s into the 70s TV show. Dedicated video about it. Um, I am so in love with this box set. This is such a cinematic show, and now it has a very cinematic presentation. The DVDs were good. The DVDs were very good. CBS Paramount Productions have been kept really well. They've done a wonderful job at preserving their catalog, but the Blu-rays are better. No, there's no special features. Yes, I don't, I'm not wild about the packaging, but you know what? The discs themselves are stellar and the price point for this. So here's the thing, it's hard to complain about packaging when you get a, a seven season, it's seven seasons on 46 Blu-rays. You guys, this is like $75 on deep discount. And there's more on Amazon. I would recommend if, if you go to Amazon and you get Sticker Shock, check out Deep Discount. They've come a long way in the last couple of years. And uh, they ship very securely. I'm not going to say nothing ever happens, but I've had a lot of good experiences with Deep Discount. $75 for seven seasons of a TV show? That's insane. I mean, I know that that's not like lunch money, but you're talking about a little over $10 for an entire series, dozens of episodes in HD on Blu-ray. A little over like 11 bucks? Come on, that is that is wonderful pricing that I think we should support. And of course, I get comments like, well, I didn't want a Blu-ray, I'm happy with DVDs. Well, I'm not, I'm happy with the Blu-rays. Anytime we have the option for something better, we deserve the best. We deserve the option for something better. Now, we have to support those things, right? You can't just expect them and not support. I, I bought the DVDs, so I can do the side-by-side -side comparisons. Um, you vote with your dollars, right? And I would hope that everyone that's interested in this will pick this up because it's a crazy deal. And if we can support this, then Paramount, CBS Paramount, will listen to that and say, Mission Impossible sold really well. What do we have that we could also serve that market with? And someone will say, well, what about Hawaii Five-0 or something? Whatever it is, that's how you get stuff like that. So I, I love it. Um, the Tony Curtis collection box set really blew me away. There's nothing like remarkable in how it's presented. It's not like there's like five discs of special features or anything, but they're movies that I just, again, that's, the point of this is not the best. The point is my favorites. It's the stuff that spoke to me. And particularly 40 Pounds of Trouble, I adore this movie and it looks so good on Blu-ray. The Perfect Furlough is another one that is just, it's just kind of magical to watch. These are such fun films. 1958 for The Perfect Furlough. 1962 for 40 Pounds of Trouble. Great Imposter, I'm kind of like, I, I like it, but I don't love it. But these two movies really, um, I, I could watch them any time of the day, over and over. And I have really discovered, like, Kino did these box sets this year. There's a lot of box sets that have come out recently. Uh, more noir. There's the Hammer, um, not the Hammer, the, um, the, uh, <laughs> Oh no, the uh, the Western the Western Spotlight, um, Western Classics Volume One. There's a Volume Two coming, so we've got like a Carol Lombard set. We've got uh, Barbara Stammett collection. This is the one that I enjoyed the most because I've just I've had a, a wonderful time discovering Tony Curtis. He's a great guy. I love Tony Curtis. Um, Beastmaster. I mean, <laughs> this has been covered a lot, so I'll try to keep my coverage minimal. But um, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I mean, I'd given up hope. This got a foreign Blu-ray release, but it never got a domestic United States Blu-ray release. And then Vinegar Syndrome's like, how about we just put it out on 4K? Does that work for you guys? We'll do a lot of like a lot of cool special features. It's like, yeah. I mean, I've showed this to you guys before, but just the level of, I mean, this is just the outer box. And you get inner artwork. You get uh, the, the Blu-ray itself. You get the... Um, like a booklet, you get additional art. It's insane, the level of prestige that they've given this movie. Uh, it's truly, truly, that's why I say this is, I can't imagine things getting any better than that, especially knowing that so many of the studios are doing away with, they, they're really focusing on streaming, right? Moving into 2021, we have two Warner Brothers and Disney who own like most of everything and they're saying, very loudly and clearly, streaming is our future. Um, so, I mean, I just, like, what a what a crazy year. Let's talk about some more music. Let's talk about the Fleetwood Mac box set. This is a recent release. This kind of late, late in the year. 
This is the Fleetwood Mac before Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham joined. And it's got a whole, it sounds nothing like the stuff that you like, you know, the, the chain is in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. This stuff sounds nothing like that. It's a complete, some of it's a little bit progress, like prog rock. Some of it's experimental. Some of it's like retro 50s sounding. It's all so different, but it's, it's cause it's a different phase in the band. Like Peter Green's here. Oh, here's the track to go look up. The Green Man Alishi with the two pronged crown. Uh, Judas Priest covered that song and do a great version, but it's a Fleetwood Mac song from 1970, I want to say. Um, but anyway, this box set has been really, really cool. Uh, all the, the mini LP replica sleeves and stuff like that. I've really enjoyed that. Um, let me make sure I have all these. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, I do. Blue Underground in 2020 decided to go not just to go into the 4k business but to double down on the 4k business and in one calendar year six 4k releases from the blue underground catalog and i am so impressed with this i'm so i'm so deeply in favor of this so supportive of this because look Traditionally, your 4K catalog is going to be the easiest sells, right? It's going to be, you know, I've got some more 4K stuff to talk about too. Uh, it's going to be Transformers movies, right? Studios are going to lead with the things that they know are going to sell. Blue Underground is a cult label that focuses on cult film, underground horror, exploitation stuff. They lean into their catalog in a way that. I mean, I feel like it's not a sure thing, right? That's what I'm so impressed with. It's a little bit of a gamble. It's a little bit of a risk. But I feel like Blue Underground comes out of 2020 as a boss, an absolute boss. Because they bring us Daughters of Darkness. Vigilant, so Daughters of Darkness is the, it's, a, it's kind of a erotic vampire sort of, maybe vampire adjacent, you know? It's just an atmospheric, um, very of its time movie that has been it's never looked so good right it's been neglected as far as like source material and how good it could look and then they finally get their hands on the source material and holy cow this is like seeing the movie in the theater first run with the director you know what i mean vigilante robert forrester fred williamson uh this is bill lustig as well william lustig who who was the the guy behind maniac as well uh we're also going to go with some fulci we've got the the house by the cemetery we got zombie we've got the new york ripper i mean these are not sure bets for 4k and so as someone who is fatigued by a lot of the mainstream stuff by the fervor for you know i don't even know if i want to name names but like yeah there's the big franchises right this is where my heart is my heart is in cinema that has representation genre movies things that are not sure bets things that need support love and attention and for blue underground to go all in like this i'm just so impressed and they've done such a good job all of these look like a billion bucks and uh, I'm telling Blue Underground is doing amazing, amazing work. Um, let's talk about this music box set. This is called uh, Looking Through a Glass Onion, The Beatles Songbook, 1966 to 1972. This is a three disc set of Beatles cover songs, people covering the Beatles through this period, 1966 to 1972. So, you're looking at the psychedelic era uh, and the like the probably the best Beatles songs, right? Because we're talking about like I Am the Walrus and Strawberry Fields Forever, stuff like that. Um, we're talking about contemporary covers of the Beatles. And they're not like a lot of them, they're not good. <laughs> but again, good is not the point. It's the availability, it's the exposure, it's the ability to listen to it and be like, wow, what an interesting take. It kind of points out how the Beatles were unique and no one could sound like the Beatles. Even if you tried, you couldn't do what the Beatles did. But in that attempt, you know, you shoot for the moon and you maybe aim, aim, or you aim for the moon, you end up somewhere in the middle, but it's, it's a wonderful experiment. And uh, this is Grapefruit Records, again, out of the UK. Love it. Don't love every song. I love the whole, you know, I love the package as a whole. 
Um, where do I want to go? You know what? Let's go. Let's go big. Let's go Al Adamson. Uh, if you had told me in th this time in 2019 that they'd be putting out a box set for Al Adamson and it would be basically everything that he ever did, multiple cuts of some of the movies, copious special features, commentaries, first of all, I would have been like, why? And then I would have been like, what a money loss. No one's going to buy that. Here we are on the other side of it, and this is one of my absolute favorite things from the entire year. No, I still have not finished this. This is, you know, this is exhaustive in its coverage. These are the movies that are included here. No, I have not watched all of these yet, but I'm about halfway in. I'm taking my time. I've got a book uh, that I'm reading as I watch these movies as well. And it's, um, again, good is not the point. I think you reach a certain point. This is maybe something we could talk about. You reach a certain point and what, whether something succeeds in its attempt or not, that's not even the point anymore. Is this good? No. But how did they try? What methods did they use? Where did they shoot? What film did they use? What were the performances like? There's a bazillion factors into every movie. How someone goes about something the talent that they use, the techniques, the lighting, that's as interesting to me, if not more, and if something is good or not. So to have Al Adamson, cult filmmaker, right? Drive-in movie, his goal was to make money. That's, that was the goal. But how does this stuff hold up? Well, it's a lot of fun. And it stands as a document, like a time capsule uh, for for what he created, when he created it. And it's it's just... It's exhaustive, right? Not exhausting, it's exhaustive. It's just so complete, so thorough, and such a wonderful snapshot of this man and his career. The documentary about the life and death of Al Adamson is magnificent. Um, I mean, it's really, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. Let's talk about a book. Let's talk about The Big Goodbye. I've referenced this in like seven videos. By the way, Amazon shipped this, and as this is about D deep discount, takes care with their stuff. Amazon, this was like all beat up. Um, this is a book about, well, there's the, it's Chinatown. Chinatown and the last years of Hollywood. And the, the thesis of the book is that Chinatown was the end of Hollywood as we know it. And I agree with that because it, it, the, the book makes such a compelling argument by looking at Polanski. You know, so he did an, the, the author did an interview, maybe with CBS, maybe it was even on NPR. I heard an interview with him somewhere, and they were like, so Roman Polanski, um, wonderful director or very flawed uh, sex criminal? And the guy was like, both. He's both of those things. We, it's not either or, he's both. And they look at Nicholson and how Nicholson, where, he, where Nicholson had come from and how even Nicholson wasn't the same after this movie. Nicholson went on to um, j just, there was a moment in time that 70s auteur movement, it was like the last glory days of the Hollywood system. You know what I mean? Uh, as, they ha as things had been made for the you know, 50 years before that. Um, and then Chinatown, out, it, it comes out after Chinatown comes out. Jaws, right? Star Wars, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Raiders of the Lost Ark. We love these movies, but they definitely took these kinds of movies out in the back alley and put a bullet in their head. And you, we will never go back to that again. We have, we have had glimpses. We saw glimpses of this in the 90s. It's a wonderful book. And if you're not super familiar with movies before Jaws, for movies before the blockbuster began, um, I think you'll really enjoy this because it talks about a lot of things that are that aren't that aren't commonly discussed right it's it's a really accessible book and again it's not either or it shows that yes Polanski had so much damage he did some terrible things but he was it, you see how the cycle perpetuates itself the death of Sharon Tate uh, you see how his childhood in World War II Poland shaped who he became it's just it's, it doesn't excuse anything but it's nice to see an exploration and, and a it's nice to see the exploration, right? So, um, what's where could we go? Like, I want to take like a wide left turn. Let's talk about Elvis because I love Elvis. This box set came out this year. This is from Elvis in Nashville. Um, it's basically 
copyright so here's the, the way music laws work is like after 50 years if you're not using something in the uk i know especially in the uk if you're not if, if something is not available um it goes into public domain so all these companies columbia is doing it with bob dylan stuff all these companies are um releasing collections like this to keep the stuff copyrighted for us it's a big deal because it means we have access to this what this is is 70s elvis music is arguably not as good as 60s elvis music definitely not as good as 50s elvis music the 70s elvis music is characterized by like a lot of sappy strings and the huge jumpsuits and stuff like that i don't mean huge in terms of size i mean huge in terms of like gaudiness and like rhinestones and stuff like that though there's an argument to be made for size as well um so here's a box set it's four discs of the material from uh, a marathon session in nashville without any of the overdubs it's just elvis and the musicians and they've done a, a collection like this before it's way down in the jungle room and it's just elvis and his band playing and it's like wow this is so much better and then you hear the other ver the, the like the album version that was released and it's so saccharine and syrupy and it's been sweetened with strings and you get to the rare to, to the raw recordings and it's visceral and it's immediate and so here's a whole uh, four disc collection of this and it's it's awesome so i had to shout that out um let's talk about the orange years the nickelodeon story so this just came in this is a late breaking development for serial at midnight we have not talked about this at all on the channel uh but this is a documentary about the foundational years of nickelodeon the orange years i'm going to say like well it's the 80s and up to 97 98 somewhere in there and that's really my era i'd say my peak era of nickelodeon is 1985 to 1995 after that i'm not watching nickelodeon before that or after that no nickelodeon but so much of that is uh in this documentary they talk about you can't do that on television they talk about um the, the like the the animated series ren and stimpy doug are you afraid of the, uh, uh, um are you afraid of the dark not animated but uh and then into like all that and stuff like that it is such a wonderful document first of all if you guys haven't seen this i highly recommend it as i'm watching this with my family first of all my daughter says it seems like things were so much more fun back then. And I'm like, yeah, they really were. This is how I grew up. Everything was so weird and wonderful and outsider mentality was celebrated. And I look at this documentary, I look at the bumpers, the Nickelodeon bumpers, like Nick, 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 Nickelodeon, yeah. And I'm like, that's probably one of the reasons that I love doo-wop because Nickelodeon was like hammering with like claymation stuff and doo-wop stuff and like, it explains a lot of my taste, the things that were in the culture. I was talking to Brie about it. It was like the stuff that we love, it was coming at us from all points. It was this wonderful like bombardment of kitsch. And we don't have that anymore. There's not a lot of kitsch these days. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about, but wonderful documentary. It, it could have more in it. There's a, I wish it was twice as long, really, because it does just begin to scratch the surface. But... It's certainly better than what was there before, which was nothing. I mean, I don't know of any documentaries about Nickelodeon before this one. And the Ren and Stimpy documentary is on the way. It'll be arriving soon. I want to talk about the Flash Gordon 4K release from Arrow because um, this is, not only is it Flash Gordon in 4K with copious special features, but it also has the documentary Life After Flash on here that was directed by Lisa Downs, who is, of course, the director of the uh, the Life After the Navigator documentary as well, talking to her, interviewing her, such a pleasure. I have such respect for Lisa Downs for her um, filmmaking skills, the way that she's able to weave narrative and to show compassion for her subjects, but also show them in a light that's very human, very relatable, right? Uh, and so I, I shout both of these out. I wish that there was like a super duper special edition of Flight of the Navigator that they could include this documentary on as well because it's it's half of it is the story of Flight of the Navigator and then half of it is the story of Joey Kramer, the child actor who um, had some trouble after Flight of the Navigator. But these two things, um, 80s film preserved, well, 
80s films preserved here, the special features are exceptional. And those documentaries, Life After Flash, Life After the Navigator, are the, mwah, it's the cherry on top. It's the, you know, I, I salute them with, with the chef's kiss because it's, it's just so, so wonderful. Um, let's see. Do a little bit more music. Uh, this is, so this is Billy, Billy Joe Armstrong's album. This is his COVID recordings. And a lot of artists made COVID recordings this year. I think this is the best. Uh, Billy Joe Armstrong, the front man for Green Day, right? Uh, and this is just stuff that he did in his home studio. And it's like a, a who's who of pop, 80s pop, punk, new wave. I mean, it's a real, it's kind of a hodgepodge, but it all fits. It all feels like Billy Joe Armstrong. That thing you do, it's, you guys, it's so good. It's probably my favorite record of the year as far as like new, we've done a lot of legacy releases, right? Like, um, you know, Digging in the Vaults. This is new and it's so good. I, I really, I think this is my favorite album of the whole year. You put it on, it's uplifting, it's fun. You can snap your fingers to it, you can dance. What could you, what, what more could you ask for? I want something peppy. I want something we can dance to. I quit, I quit. Uh, that thing you do. Speaking of music as well, the Kenny Everett video show, the complete series. This also comes from Via Vision out of Australia. Um, I don't know if it's just a consequence of where I grew up in America, when I grew up there, but I don't ever, I didn't even know about this until Via Vision released this or they solicited it. And I was like, what? I have, I, I love this show. I love this show. It's got that set, that Nickelodeon spirit that I was talking about, MTV punk rock outsider like pirate radio kind of a feel all over this animation from cosgrove hall which is the people that did danger mouse which ended up on nickelodeon um it's very much it, it it's the kind of stuff that i loved when i was younger and that kind of went away and i never knew about this so discovering this now is like this weird trip back in time because I get to experience this like I was there. Tons of musical performances, Elvis Costello, Thin Lizzy, um, uh, so many, like there. some of them I haven't heard of because they're British artists that we didn't really get over here. Um, let's see, Bonnie Tyler, City Boy, <laughs> The Moody Blues. Who are the Moody, and no, I've heard of The Moody Blues, I'm just kidding. Uh, the Who? Who, who are the who? The Boomtown Rats. Oh, man, I'm so impressed with those. Adam, Adam C. Uh, Boomtown Rats, man. It's good stuff. Uh, so anyway, this is this is great as well. I've had a blast revisiting this. I want to talk about some Warner Archive titles. We're almost done. Warner Archive uh, throughout the year. Space Ghost and Dino Boy. You know, I'm of the Space Ghost coast-to-coast -coast generation. That was like appointment TV for Gen Xers. And I was one of those. And so I love Space Ghost, but to see the OG Space Ghost is even better for me. So that's the complete series of that. And then we got Tex Avery, Restorations Volume 1 and Volume 2. And these are equally amazing. Tex Avery's cartoons are silly, subversive, self-referential, meta. They are smart cartoons the the volume two has like all the future like the house of the future the automobile of the future all that stuff that's that's in volume two uh love these hoping that good things continue in 2021 with warner brothers particularly warner archive um because um just knowing what's happening publicly with warner brothers as they announce you know streaming is their main focus and they're taking things like theater and streaming on the same day Hope, hopefully warner archive um continues to put out exceptional stuff in 2021 we're going to end it with my favorite video game experience of 2020 you will never guess i'm going to give you five seconds what do you think my favorite video game of 2020 was in three two it was Destroy All Humans for the PlayStation 4. I played a lot of video games in 2020, but, and this is a remake. This is the crazy thing. This is a remake of a, of a 2005 game, I think. This is the perfect game for 2020 because you play an alien, you play Crypto 137, who it's it's silly and it's subversive. Like you're, it's an alien invasion from the perspective of the alien, and you are. He sounds like Jack Nicholson, and he's like, "All right, I'm gonna have some carnage with all the people here on Earth, plopping brains out of people's head. That's one of your weapons. You just like pull brains out of people's heads, and you get like DNA points that you can spin in the shop. You have a ray gun. You have a death ray. You have a spaceship that you can fly around to destroy the towns." 
it was the perfect game for 2020. I loved it so much. I'm still playing it, honestly, because once you finish the main plot, it's kind of just a sandbox thing. You kind of just run around and <laughs> but you just blow up. Oh, I gotta be careful. You can, if you wanted to, you could blow up cop cars. You could destroy the White House. You could, I mean, anything, any hostilities that you're feeling, it's like Grand Theft Auto. You just take out your hostilities in this fictional 1950s world. You know, I love the 50s. When worlds collide is on my favorites list. This is like, you get to play it. You get to do it. So I don't know what, I have no idea what the reception for this game is. I have no idea if there's plans for a remake of Destroy All Humans 2. I just know I love it. And I was able to just sit for long periods of time and not have some kid who's like, hey, <laughs> I killed you. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. I can just wander this town and do what I got to do with my ray gun and my death gun. I can like pick up cows in the air with telepathy and like shoot them into barns and things like that. Wonderful. So <laughs> um, that's, that's it. That's my favorites of the year. I'm sure I forgot things, but what we're going to do is, as I say, in, in early January, I'm going to do kind of a retrospective and uh we'll try to circle back and uh i'll talk about some of the the big major releases I, i'm going to highlight what a special year 2020 was i remember when i did this in 2019 talking about the year that was for 2019 i said that it was the biggest year that i could remember for physical media well 2020 blew it away blew it away we got new labels right we got cauldron films we got imprint so uh it's an absolute wonderful time to be a fan of physical media to be a fan of film television pop culture preservation look we've covered all as aspects of pop culture uh the preservation work being done right now i think is as i say it's the top of the mountain i don't think it can continue like this it's as good as it can get i hope i'm wrong but well, you know what we'll find out together so guys thank you so much thank you for the year that 2020 was thank you for being a part of it i uploaded over 200 videos in the year 2020 a lot of videos um, and if you saw even a fraction of those that means a lot I appreciate you guys so very much so take care have a happy new year and until next time I will catch you later <laughs>